All right. Well, you know, uh, I heard that yesterday's Women's Day was flat incredible, guys. You know, we had we had almost two visitors for every disciple. Come on. And uh, just what an incredible job. I just want to thank all the women that uh, put their hearts and souls into the event. Uh, we, want to, we want to be continually thanking Marcos for preparing all the food and the lunch for everybody. And, uh, and I do want to take a moment just to give a special applause to those who shared their testimonies. Because you guys... Uh, I, I heard a, I heard a bunch of them the other night when there when there was a little run through and uh, gosh you guys have some incredible stories yeah. incredible stories and then also my wife did a bang up job preaching the word there so uh, that was that was awesome I'm sure there will be people in heaven because of yesterday's event Come on, yeah. Amen All right I'm gonna start you off with a little story There was once this guy who had always been poor Everybody thinks that's him that's them but. And one day he decides to pray to God that he would win the lotto. He prays and prays and prays, but doesn't win. Every day he prays to God that he could win the lotto. It just never happens. And then one day, after he had gotten very, very old and very, very frustrated, he got on his knees and he said, Look, God, this is the last time I'm going to pray. Please let me win the lotto. Or at least tell me why you aren't letting me win. Suddenly an angel appeared before the man and says, Look, sir, could you do God a favor at least buy a lotto ticket? <laughs> certain rules about having the things that we want in life, you know? If you want to win the lotto, you can't win the lotto without buying a lotto ticket. But you know, many times in life, we want our life to turn out certain ways. But we just don't do those basic things that we need to do so that we have the life we say we want. And so there are rules for life. And so today, the title of our lesson... And, uh, we're go- and if you're visiting, we're going through the book of Colossians. And today we are on chapter 3. And so at the beginning we, have a, we, have a, we had a handout. Uh, if you don't have a handout, go ahead and raise your hand and the ushers will get you one. Uh, but the handout has an outline of the book so you can study it out. And uh, a bunch of pictures of the glamorous hotel that Paul stayed at while he wrote this letter. But um, cold stone floors. And uh, he wrote this encouraging letter to us. But you know, uh, in chapters 1 and 2, as we cover chapters 1 and 2, Paul focuses on not being tied down by the rules and regulations of the Old Covenant. Isn't it awesome that God doesn't make us hold to the Old Covenant? I mean, sometimes some of you women would have to be banned for a week from church. You know, we'd have to sacrifice animals. There'd be blood everywhere. It just, just, I'm just grateful that God doesn't make us go through that anymore. You know what I'm saying? And yet... Right here in chapters 1 and 2, there was so much heresy going on throughout the church that you had to hold to the Old Covenant teachings. And that there was another heresy that because God had ascended from heaven to be with us, that He wasn't really human. Thus minimizing the incredible life that Jesus lived as a man. And Paul's teaching us that rituals won't save us. And he's trying to convey that, you know, under the Old Covenant, what guided everyone was the rules. Because because Moses said we have to do this, we're just going to go do it. We're just going to show up to church and we're just going to sing because Moses said we have to. Uh And he's trying to get us to understand that as disciples, we can be like that. We can look at the Bible like a set of rules that we have to follow instead of God's heart in our hand. He's trying to get us to understand they were, tra- they were going through a large transition in the first century. The kingdoms that they knew were the kingdoms of David, the kingdoms of Saul, the kingdoms of Solomon. They were physical kingdoms that went to war, conquered people. And yet he was trying to get them to understand this is not a physical kingdom to be a part of the church. 
It's a kingdom within our heart, which makes everything a matter of our heart. See, while the Bible is not a book that should be looked at as a book of rules, there are still rules. And so today, in chapter 3, Paul delves into some of these rules that we're going to look at. And so the title of our lesson is Rules for an Eternity. And right here in chapter 3, Paul lists out some of the rules for living a holy and righteous life. And we need to understand today that while breaking these rules here and there doesn't condemn us, breaking these rules does harden us. Mm, come on. On the inside. In the heart where the kingdom is. And the harder that our hearts can get, the further that we drift from being submissive, the further we drift from being the humble servants God called us to be, and the further we drift from having broken and contrite spirits, which are so pleasing to God. Yeah. And so these, these are not specific rules that are being mundanely and monotonously done, but these are rules to stimulate your hearts okay. to freely and creatively okay. give all of yourself to God. Now, I'd like to read two scriptures to set the tone for today's lesson. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 4, amen? Right. Proverbs chapter 4, in verse 23. I believe this scripture captures the essence of why we have the rules in Colossians 3. Okay. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Go to Matthew 22. Okay. Matthew chapter 22. And I believe this chapter of Colossians 3 ties very heavily to what is taught right here in Matthew 22 and verse 36. Come on, bro. Teacher, which, of, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like itself. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Wow. Now keep in mind as we go through today that God does not say to nod your head yes to all these things as we study them and then go home and just do the same old thing again. Uh -oh. Come on. He doesn't say try to do these things. Right. And say, oh, well, just do your best and let it all just land where it may. Come on. We need to understand as we read this chapter that God isn't making suggestions on how to live a better life. Right. Yeah. But these are rules to live by for an eternity. Yeah. You know, one day... We're going to be in heaven with Jesus. Come on. That's going to be awesome. Yeah. It's going to be a very long day because time will stop. <laughs> but we need to understand something. That being in heaven doesn't guarantee obedience. How do we know this? Because they're Satan. And all of his demons that were angels that were cast out of heaven because in heaven they did not obey these things. Wow. Wow. And so I think we need to understand... This proves that if we cannot obey them here, there's no way we'll obey in heaven. Come on. With that in mind, let's go to Colossians chapter 3, amen? Right. Amen. There's something a little deep to think about, you know? Yeah. you got to go, wow, those guys were in heaven and couldn't get happy there. Uh-oh. Be thankful. So in Colossians 3, we're going to begin in verse 1. We simply have... Four points today that go right along with uh, the teaching in Matthew 22 there. Okay. Point number one will be love the Lord your God with all your mind. Point number two will be with all of your heart. Point number three, with all your soul. And we'll close out with our fourth point, love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? Amen. Amen. Colossians 3 verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. 
Set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. You know, I'm going to do a little bit of sharing today. I don't know about you, but I used to be so controlled by my emotions. Guess you can relate. Come on, bro. But you know, I used to be so controlled by my emotions, even as a disciple of Jesus. I hated seeing people walk away from the church. I still hate that. But it used to control my emotions when I'd see people walk away from the church. Because I'd always blame somebody for them leaving. There was always in my mind somebody who did something wrong or didn't do something that needed to be done, and that was why they, they were gone. And that made me walk around the church full of fear all the time with this doomsday mentality. Oh, everybody's just going to walk away. Don't do that or there's a wa- somebody's going to leave. Just emotional all the time. Come on. Everything that happened tied to people walking away from God or the church falling apart. Come on. And yet, God wants us to remember that it's His church. That He's in control of everything. And He wants us to set our hearts and our minds, not on the things that we see that give us fear, but on eternal things. This is why these are rules for an eternity, right? He wants us to set our minds on things that will never disappear. Or fade. And so, you know the other thing that used to control my emotions a lot was when I saw a selfishly ambitious leader. When I saw a guy who appeared to want his name to be great rather than God's name and his church to be great. That used to just tick me off. Still does, but it doesn't control me anymore. (laughs) But see, if I saw that somebody was selfishly ambitious from my avid perception... I'd lose fruits of the Spirit. I'd just give them a piece of my mind, you know? But my mind was on this earthly thing, this selfishly ambitious leader, not on God. Totally forgetting that God is in complete control and is in totally sovereign of who He allows to lead and who He didn't. Then I had to remember He let Saul lead. He continued to let David lead after adultery and murder. He continued to let Peter, who was a racist, lead. He only wanted Jews to be saved at the beginning. Thank you. And I had to realize that God is sovereign above and over all sin in all leaders. But then, you know, I went in, uh, I was getting ready to go into the ministry, and I asked advice from one of my brothers, Jay Hernandez. And I said, hey, Jay. Here we go into ministry. What do you think is the biggest thing I need to work on? And he said, You are too emotional for the ministry. You get far too angry about the things that you see. Amen. Yes, I'm not the only guy. Amen. Me and Sean are emotional. Together. It's awesome. We had an emotional quiet time this morning together, too. But you know, right here in verse 1, God calls us to set our hearts. Not to try and set our hearts. Not to hope we can set our hearts. Not to nod and agree with the idea of setting our hearts. God calls you to set your heart this morning. The Greek word, zetiety, means to strive for or seek earnestly. He says, strive earnestly to set your heart on the right things. And the right things are nothing that we see before our eyes. Because they're all above. See, this, li- this requires that you live by faith and not by sight. This requires that the mistakes you see people make do not dictate where your heart's at. 
This dictates that the sins that you see do not dictate where your heart's at. See, it requires centering everything in your life around an ascended and glorified Christ where He's in control of everything. Now verse 2, he goes on, and he changes up from setting our hearts to setting our minds. See, the, see, the Bible does call you to love the Lord your God with all of your mind. And right here, God tells you to set your mind. You know, you cannot love the Lord your God with all your mind unless you set your mind to do that. Now right here, it's a, the word, we see the word set again. It's a, now the Greek word there is a variation of the same one we just saw. But this variation means to concentrate. And right here he says, concentrate your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Boy, that not that challenging. That's an upward call for all of us. But to put it more in context, it's the same Greek word here that's used when Jesus looked at Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. Because you do not have the things of God in mind. See, Peter was not setting his mind on things above. He was setting his mind on Jesus dying. It's also the same word that we get in Philippians 2. When we are called to be like-minded with Jesus. Go to 2 Corinthians. Keep your place there. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Right here we just get an incredible practical on how to love the Lord our God with all of our mind. 2 Corinthians 10. We'll begin in verse 4. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish, not kind of wound, Come on. not slow down, no, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive. Most of our thoughts, right? No, 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 false doctrine, sorry there. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Boy, don't you wish you could take captive every single thought? Well, the reality is you can. You have divine power living inside of you if you're a disciple of Jesus this morning. And that power can help you to take captive every one of those stupid, little, ridiculous thoughts that goes through our mind. And you can make it obedient to Christ. Is that not? Doesn't that just change everything for you? You know, I've told this story a few times, but it fits what we're talking about here today. When I was in LA, I I wasn't in the ministry yet. I was, I was uh, asked to go out and travel from Orange County, California, to Palm Springs to do a Bible talk. Well, that's a three and a half hour drive on a weekday and uh, the Bible talk started at 7.30 so I had to get off work early and leave at 3.30 to be able to make sure that I got all the way out to Palm Springs by 7.30 and we had been given instruction hey if you're going to one of the outlying ministries and three and a half hours out would be considered outlying ministry you know um, you're gonna, I need, we need you to do uh, the seeking God study because the whole church was going through the first principle studies and the outlying ministries there's just no way they could get in for midweeks so the instruction was to do the Seeking God study for the Bible talk. Cool. So I left work at 3.30. And, you know, back then I didn't have a cell phone, a smartphone to get all my emails everywhere I went and all that. Well, at 4 o'clock, the guys that oversaw that Bible talk sent me an email that, asking me to do a particular Bible talk. Um, that was only about 10 minutes long. And they said they had some visitors that were coming and they were kind of picky people and they just wanted a short, concise Bible talk that, that would fit them. And uh, I got there and never saw the email. So they, in their minds, I'm going to do this little 10-minute Bible talk, and I do a one-hour study on seeking God. 
<laughs> and, uh, you know, it was awesome. There were six people there at the Bible talk, six visitors. And, and it turned out later that all six of those people ended up getting baptized, which was really awesome. That's the first time I'd ever seen that in the Bible talk. Every person that came on one day got baptized, you know. It was really cool. But after the Bible talk, you know, the visitors were all fired up and everything. And the people who are on the house are like, hey, thank you so much for coming out. Can we get you anything to drink? And then, no, no, I'm fine. i got to get back. And it's a three-hour drive back. And so I, I got in the car and I headed out feeling really good about myself, you know. And uh, about 15 minutes later, my phone rings and it's Kip. He goes, hey, bro, how's it going? And I said, oh, great, bro. We had the most cranking Bible talk. Man. Every single person wanted to study the Bible. This is awesome. He says, oh, that's great. And he goes, so, you know, I got a call that said that the Bible talk just didn't go very well. And I was like, really? Wow, okay. A little bit of feelings start welling up, you know. You can, all, can anybody relate with that, you know? I'm going, okay, it seemed like it went well to me. <laughs> Isn't people wanting to study the Bible, the Bible talk going well? And he's like, well, I didn't hear so all of that. And he, he says, you know, they said that you went on for an hour. He goes, did you really do a Bible talk that was like an hour? And I said, well, yeah, you told us to do the Seeking God study. It takes an hour to do. And he's like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot about that. He goes, oh, all right. And he says, you know, in doing the study, I kind of given the history about how Kip had came up with the study, which is a pretty cool story. But then afterwards, they're like, yeah, you know, they were all concerned because you kept mentioning me in the study. Like, maybe you're there's like a little idolizing or something going on there. And I was, then I got angry. Because if you know me, you know I don't care what any man thinks. Right. Unless they're telling me that I'm, that I'm doing stuff I'm not doing. <laughs> and so then I began to well up in anger. And Kip goes, whoa, whoa, bro, whoa, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You seem like you're getting a little upset. And I'm like, you're doggone right I'm upset. And he goes, well... Why don't you just let it go? Oh. <laughs> hey, man. You ever had that thing that you know you just, just need to let go of? It's not really a big deal, but you just... Hold on to that thing, you know? Because I'm mad, and I want to be mad right now. And I was like, bro, I went to leave the house... These guys give me a big old hug, tell me how awesome I did, try and give me food. I've only been gone 15 minutes. And I was like, and how the heck did you find out about it? <laughs> They're like, well, you know, they called Lou Jack, and Lou Jack called me, and oh, so the whole world knows about it, right? Okay. Mine's just racing. Nothing about God going on in my mind right there. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and so I said, ah, bro. And he's like, well, you just sound really angry. And I'm ticked, man. I said, why don't you just let it go? I said, because I'm mad. And that, when I'm mad, I'm mad. And I don't know when I calm down, okay? <laughs> Maybe tomorrow or the next day, I'll be, I won't be mad anymore. But right now, I'm mad. On, he goes, well, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> and he goes, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I've already turned the car around. Oh, and I'm heading around back. Oh, We're going to go have a little talk in Jesus. Oh, because these guys are talking about me. Oh, and he goes, I don't know if that's the best thing for you to be doing right now. <laughs> he goes, I have a little challenge for you. And he goes, I want to challenge you to not go talk to them until you're nice and calm and at peace again. And I was like, but Matthew 18 says, if somebody sins against you, you take it to them. And he goes, yeah, but there's also Ephesians 4.29 that commands you to have wholesome talk. So, I just want to challenge you to not go talk to them until you're at peace with them again. Because your sin is your sin and theirs is theirs. And I was like, oh, that stinks, dude. <laughs> And he goes, but you still sound mad. And I'm like, well, of course I'm still mad. I go, what? what am, is my anger like a light switch? I can just turn it on and off. And he goes, well, actually, yeah. the power of the 
Holy Spirit gives you a spiritual light switch so that you can set your heart. He goes, in fact, why don't you pull the car on over and get your Bible out for a second. So I pull the car over. He goes, I want you to turn to Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. The Bible tells you right here, Ron, that you can set your heart. It says that you can set your mind. So right there is your spiritual light switch so that you can decide to let it go and not be angry anymore. And when you're ready to do that, then why don't you go and have whatever talk you want to have? And I was like, okay. He says, so what are you going to do? And I said, well, I already turned my car back around (laughs) and I'm heading home. And I'll have a nice two and a half hour prayer on the way home. (laughs) But you know, very sadly to my shame, I didn't go talk to them for three and a half months. That's how long I stayed angry. And you know, right here I think we've got to get a deep conviction. You know, God doesn't ask you to do something that you are incapable of doing. And I think it's very important here that we learn, and that we learn to get the discipline to set our hearts and to set our minds on things above, not on all the attitudes and the things that we get. Amen? So hopefully I gave you a great example of what not to do. Amen? Do not be like Ron before he learned this lesson. But see, you've got to realize the purpose of this rule. And certainly it is a rule to set your heart and to set your minds. Let's go back to Colossians 3. See, the purpose of the rule appears in verse 4. See, Christ had not appeared in my life that night. He says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. You know, it really stunk going to church those three and a half months. Because I'd go in, and here they'd come. And you know, I wanted to go talk to them. I wanted to share how I felt. But I made a commitment that I wouldn't do it until I was at peace. It took me three and a half months. And so, Christ had not appeared. And every time there was communion. You know, and God made it so that I didn't take communion. And nobody even asked me about it. The plate would pass right on by me. And nobody even asked me. Wow, you didn't take communion, bro. What's up? I think that was of God. Now, I can get an attitude right now and go, dang, nobody even asked me about it. What's wrong with all these people, you know? <laughs> but see, we're supposed to set our mind and our hearts. See, the purpose of this rule is so that you can appear in glory with Jesus. So set your hearts, set your mind on things above. So, you can love God with all your mind. Amen? Let's move on to verse 5 here. Okay. All your heart. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. (laughs) Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Here comes the list of all lists right here. Anger. We could just stop right there, huh? Rage. Woo! Whole other lesson. Malice. Slander. And filthy language from your lips. You know, it's an interesting thing. He groups together these sexual immorality. He says them separately. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, desire, and greed. Which is, all of those things are idolatry. Idolatry. You struggling with impurity today? You're struggling with idolatry. You're struggling with greed. You don't want to give to God what's His. You want to live your life in such a way so you don't have enough to give back to Him, the simple little bit of what He asks you. You struggle with greed. You struggle with idolatry. But He's really talking about the heart right here. All of our hearts. You know, it's a truth that's in this. Very basic concept behind this rule. You cannot love God with all of your heart 
when your heart is filled with all kinds of sin. And it's easy to not punch somebody anymore as disciples, you know. That one's easy. But not wanting to punch somebody, that can be a different story now, can it? See, it's, it's easy to stop yelling, but getting to where you don't feel the need to yell or don't feel the urge to want to yell, well, that's another story now, isn't it? Now, you're going to get to that place, we all do, where we feel like welling up in our hearts still. And just because it happens every once in a while doesn't mean you haven't obeyed these scriptures fully. But, boy, are you getting angry every week? Is there something bothering you all the time? Come on. See, this is what he's talking about. Your goal is to rid yourself of all of it. Ask yourself this question. So why don't you just let it go? (laughs) You know, uh, it is certainly a very loving God who will institute a rule which leads us toward guarding our own hearts. Is that not awesome? Like the rule isn't there to put this burden on you. It's there to free you of all the things that tie us down in life. It's a very loving God that leads us to guarding our hearts so that when we come together to worship Him as one man, that that worship is genuine and fulfilling. It's a very loving God that will give us something that protects us from having our hearts die. You know, go to Romans chapter 8. Keep your place. Romans chapter 8. And if you're thinking, boy, it'd be great to be able to feel like this all the time. Well, you can. If you're unable to, then maybe you need to get with the person that brought you. Or maybe you need to get with an older brother and sister if you are a disciple. And find out why the Holy Spirit isn't empowering you to be able to live this way. Yeah, to be honest, that's why Sean and I had quiet time this morning. We, we sat to talk through some things. Just to help him out so that he can have the fullness of life as a Christian. But in Romans 8, in verse 12, and you notice we got up very early and had a quiet time and breakfast before we went to church. That's why Sean's so fired up. That's why I'm so fired up. You, you can get up early and show up early and have breakfast with people before church too. It's awesome. But in verse 12 he says, Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature. See, some of you feel obligated. Well, because I'm feeling it, i got to let it all out. I'm just being real, bro. Wow. And see, when you say that, you're communicating, you have an obligation to your sinful nature to let it all out. You know, the Bible says right here, we have an obligation that is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. You want to know why a lot of people walk away from God? There it is right there. No, they point, oh, well, that person did this to me, that person ticked me off, well, I don't like this and I don't like that. Really, they died inside. Because they lived according to their sinful nature. Because they had way more problems in the first century than we do today. Let me tell you, you read your Bible, you come to find, we got a really awesome church compared to Corinth. Come on. Okay? I mean, they had guys sleeping with their mothers there. Okay? They were doing things sexually that aren't even thought of anymore. It was horrific. It was horrible. They were suing each other. Anybody sued anybody in the church that you know of? Take them to court? They were suing each other. It was awful. And we get all welled up in our feelings. Oh, I don't like what he said. I don't like what she said. Yet we have such an awesome church. If you live according to that sinful nature, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit... You put to death. You notice that? You see, you cannot put things to death without the Spirit. 
Some of you are trying within your own strength to put things to death, and it just doesn't work. It just keeps creeping on back in. Oh, I did good for a week. Oh. Come on. You coming to church and everybody's wondering why you're singing like this. <laughs> Because you're just going off your own strength and you don't know what to do. Because you got to use the Spirit to put things to death, guys. That's why God gave you His Holy Spirit. So you don't have to be overwhelmed with all this stuff. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you receive a spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. See, we get it all out in our times with God. That's what Kip was trying to give me advice to do. Was to get it all out in my relationship with God so that I could be at peace again and then go have a righteous interaction. He says, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. You know, as I look around through the church, you get a different perspective when you stand up here week after week. And you see everyone's faces week after week. And uh, I see week after week, some of you sad. Yeah. I see week after week, some of you angry. Come on. I see week after week, some of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing there, you know. I'm not going to get angry. <laughs> he had a quiet time about that today. You can't hurt him today. But see, week after week I see this. That means you're not loving God with all your heart. That's all it means. The Bible says if you only acknowledge your guilt, God can heal you. You know, we need to also remember again, and keep in mind that God isn't asking you to do these things. He's not suggesting a better way to live. He's laying down rules that are to be fully obeyed. Yeah. Got real quiet for it. Wow. <laughs> wow. You know, going on here in verse 9 of Colossians 3, he turns his focus in a minute. He's talking about the deep things that live in our hearts. And then all of a sudden he shifts. And he says in verse 9, Do not lie to each other. And I start talking about our interaction with each other. Because what's in your heart affects how you treat others. He says, Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. And have put on the new self. Which is to be renewed in knowledge. In its image of its creator. See, it is your knowledge of God that allows you to set your heart. It's what makes you the new creation. Certainly you're made that at baptism, but you can be baptized and then go right back to your old self the same day. It is your knowledge of God and how awesome He is, how powerful He is, that transforms your mind to knowing what power lives inside you. To set that heart. But He says... uh, Verse 11. Here, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. See, God knew that in order for you to love Him with all of your heart, you've got to love the family of believers with all of your heart. How about it? Do you love our church? If you don't love our church with all your heart, you don't love God with all your heart. (laughs) Because we are a part of God. See, God gives us this rule 
to protect us from ruining our relationships with each other. Because there's a, there's a very vicious cycle that happens that you see year after year. People get angry with each other. They start lying to each other because they don't trust each other anymore. And they ruin their relationships with each other. And then they end up hating God at the end of it. And so, you got to realize there's no barbarian, Scythian. There's no slave. There's no free. There's no black. There's no white. There's no Latin ministry, English ministry. There is Christ and those that are with Him. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you got long hair like JB or not, you know? We got all, co- all kinds of color hair. We got all kinds of people. Dre- some people are dressed up, some people are not, you know? Amen. But you know, if you're a disciple of Jesus, you're with Christ. You are one. There are no social classes, there are no races in the kingdom. There's only disciples or not disciples. See, you leave those worldly views in your heart of who's better than another person, you begin to hate your brothers and sisters. You begin to hold things in your heart toward people who haven't done anything to you at all. You know... uh, Once you harden yourself toward those disciples, there's no other option. You've already hardened yourself toward God. And if you if you say things like, "Oh, this church's going to fall apart," God's not in control in your mind. People are in control. You're holding something else in your heart to make you say things like that. You know, uh, I talked to this church leader one time. And he says, you know, all these guys in our leadership, they're a bunch of cowards and sissies. They all talk about me behind my back. (laughs) Then he talked about how selfishly ambitious and greedy they all were. And then somewhere down the line, he was like, yep, I'm supposed to lead this mission team. When I go, I'm asking to be paid $100,000 a year. And I said, you know, I quit my $130,000 a year job to go in the ministry. And I, uh, actually that's not true. I quit my $130,000 a year job to save my soul. (laughs) Then I got another $100,000 a year job that I quit to go in the ministry. And I said, you know who you sound like? He's like, I said, you sound like the executives of the companies I used to work for. Stepping on each other, trampling on each other's heads to get above. Yeah. Hating on each other. Wow. Slandering, gossip. And you're focused on them? You're focused on your brothers? So let me tell you something. All of these cowards and sissies, yeah, all their sins are forgiven. They're perfect in God's sight. So what are you looking at? I said, you know, when I left the corporate world, I really looked forward to never having to be in the midst of that kind of stuff ever again. And I'll be doggone if you're going to bring it into my church. So you're going to go have a talk with them, or I am going to go have a talk with them. And then you'll talk anyway. Because we don't do this in the kingdom of God, and no, you're not going to make a hundred grand a year. You sissy. But see, he had hardened himself towards his brothers and sisters. I mean, does that shock you that a leader was talking like that? No. Leaders are men. And women. Have the same struggles. They need the same mercy. But he hardened himself toward God and toward his brothers and sisters. It made him edgy chip on his shoulder. 
made him feel the need to go, well, I should make more because I'm the one that baptizes more. No. We get whatever God gives us, and that's that. See, you must learn to love the Lord your God with all your heart, taking captive every thought and putting it to death, making it obedient to Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Colossians 3, verse 12. All your soul. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. See, he felt the need to just take it a little further there, you know? And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And, don't forget this one, be thankful. All your soul. You know, right here he's talking about clothing ourselves. Some of y'all look pretty good today. But when we look inside your soul, what do your clothes look like? Are they ugly, dirty, smelly, stinky clothes of hatred and anger? Distancing yourselves from people? Not jumping in and being involved? Waiting for someone to pull you in? Or are they the clothes that God calls you to dress yourselves with? You know, uh, we talk about a man who wears his heart on his sleeve. But a disciple wears his heart on his life. See, how you live tells everything about what's in your heart. How you choose to spend your time, who you choose to focus on, who you hang out with and don't hang out with, what you watch on TV and what you don't, what you eat and don't eat. All these things tell what's really inside your heart. Whether you love God with all your heart, whether you are really a disciple of Jesus, just because you get the disciple pin when you get baptized, doesn't mean you're a disciple of Jesus. Just because you're a disciple doesn't mean you're perfect. But don't claim the name if you're not going to play the game. I just came up with that right now, actually. That's one of those ones from God. I didn't write that down. But you know, uh, whether you try to hide what's really in your heart, or maybe you're just out of touch with what's in your heart, those who are around you that see your life know what's really in your heart. That's why God sets up these relationships with each other. So that we can help one another. Like we, talk, like we talked about in the last chapter. Teaching and admonishing each other. Listen to your brothers and sisters who are around you. They know what's in your heart. Yeah, that's right. We spend so much time deflecting what's not in our heart. Nope, no, no, that's not right. No, you didn't understand what I said. Oh, no, you misunderstood. No, that's not really what I'm saying. <laughs> we spend so much time with that instead of going, okay, let me get in touch with what you're saying. Because you obviously see something. Because the way we live our life tells what's really in our heart. I had to learn something as a disciple. I used to be so proud of that I always knew where my heart was at. (laughs) And then I learned I was deceived. And I had to learn that Satan is smarter than I am. Satan knows me better than I know myself. And I have a feeling he knows you better than you know yourself. Which means you can get out of touch with where you're really at. That's why you need your brothers and sisters. We all know the lifestyle that we're supposed to live as Christians. And everyone can sense when you're not living that lifestyle. Everyone knows. Then you wonder why it's weird around you. See, the new heart of a disciple is so 
clear. It's, a, it's in the light. It's bright. You can't miss it. It's not even close to the darkness. But you have to ask yourself, you know, you learn about kindness in the Bible, right? But are you putting kindness on in your life? And let it affect those around you so that it becomes real in your life. Knowing about kindness means nothing if your life doesn't display kindness. You read about humility. You read about compassion. You read about patience. But it is only when you're giving all your soul to God that you can really be humble. You cannot give your heart half-heartedly to God and think that you're going to end up humble. You cannot give half your soul to the Lord and expect to be patient with people. Imagine God was patient for 40 years with those knucklehead Israelites who always were not thankful. Who were always angry about something. Always saying, oh, the church is going to fall apart. We're going to die in the desert, Moses. Every decision Moses made was going to kill the whole church. Forty years God put up with that. Come on. We've only been a church for three years and some of you have totally lost your patience with each other. Oh, just get him out of here. Do you realize that means hell? I'm so sick of that. Well, did you realize about your own sin? You know, why does he say to love him with all of our soul? Well, because we're around sinful, imperfect people all the time, it takes all of our soul to keep on doing it. It takes giving of ourselves in a way that it gives everything so that we continue to love those that God has around us. Because it's so easy to lose our love for each other. Go to, Phili- go to keep in place, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 and verse 20. He says, You know, you, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by all the people hurting you, right? It's being corrupted by your deceitful desires. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbors. A recurring theme we got going here, huh? For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Well, there's a rule to follow, huh? Come on. And do not give the devil a foothold. Then he goes on to the unwholesome talk stuff, you know? Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do you know that if somebody ticks you off, you don't have to speak with them to stop being angry about it? And you're not supposed to let that day close out while you're still angry. How many of you have gone to bed angry this week? See, you break the rule and you suffer the consequences. You keep breaking that rule, you kill your soul. You know, before I was a Christian, I used to go to work at our family business. I was the laziest little guy you ever met, man. I would go and hide in the back in the containers where we stored people's furniture and lay out the pads and go to sleep and cover myself up with them so nobody saw me. That's awful. I was lustful. I was immoral. I was full of anger. God says, give all yourself to something. It was anger. Woo! I was an angry person. I hated my father. I hated my mother. I cussed. It was like water pouring out of my mouth. 
I was debaucherous as all get out. I, I knew how to give myself fully to things, for sure. My, my Chevy Blazer, I spent $50,000 on the stereo system. My Chevy Beretta, I spent $20,000 on that stereo system. So that I could drown out my sorrows in music. I'd drive around with that thing as loud as I could go. Everywhere I went. I drove down the street. My picture, my, I'm not joking. My, my neighbor's pictures would fall off their walls when I drove down the street. <laughs> So I hated everybody and they all hated me. <laughs> and the more angry they got with me, the, the more speakers I would put in my car. And the louder I would do it and the later I'd drive by their house. That's how I lived. I was in L.A. Everybody flips each other off all day long in L.A. I drove 120 miles an hour everywhere I go. I remember I got pulled over and I was doing 138 miles an hour in my blazer. As a race car driver, I had taken the engine out of my Blazer and rebuilt it. It was a fast little car. I had 1,100 pounds of stereo equipment in that car. And I was doing 138 miles an hour down the five freeway. <laughs> Cop pulled me over and he said, You know how fast you were going? <laughs> I said, Yep. He goes, How fast were you going? I ain't telling you. <laughs> I know how this works. He says, you know I can take you to jail right now? I didn't even answer. I was sunk if I said anything. And he goes, well, I can tell you no our little things of how we get you to confess. He said, so I'm just going to write you a ticket for 80 miles an hour and you're going to be really happy that that's all I give you a ticket for. All right. Yep. You know, uh, I liked fast cars. Women all the time. And I was spiteful, angry young punk. I've been a disciple now for almost 19 years. March 19th will be 19 years for me. And you know... Yeah. You know there's a Holy Spirit because I can count on this hand how many times I've cussed in 19 years. That don't happen by anything but the Spirit of God. But you know, I love my father. I love my mother. I don't even have the cars anymore. You want to know where they went? I sold them for special. The $50,000 stereo system... That was my first special, the first year as a Christian. I kept the stereo from the other car. <laughs> but I sold it a couple of years later. You see, now I give all of my heart and soul to the kingdom of God. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Everything I have is in the kingdom. I will gladly go to heaven with nothing left. And I hope that you can learn to be at peace in that same way. You've got to love the Lord your God with all your soul by putting on your new self. Amen? Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. We'll close out with our final point. Amen. Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through Him. Then he goes on to some very specific rules. Wives. Got any wives in here? Yeah. <laughs> Submit to your husbands. <laughs> Submit to your husbands. As fitting in the Lord, amen? <laughs> your husband says, I don't want to go to church today. Don't submit to that. <laughs> See, it's as fitting in the Lord. Because it is the Lord you are following, not your husband. Husbands. How many husbands we got in here? All right. 
<laughs> what a rule. Love your wives. <laughs> Isn't that why you married her? Yeah. Yeah. Why do we have to say it, though? Love your wives. <laughs> oh, there's more? <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> and do not be harsh with them. Wow. What's coming out of your heart, brothers? Come on. What's coming out of your heart? Have you been harsh with your wife this week? You've been good, Come on, bro. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> From the horse's mouth right there. I, I told you. But you know, we've got to get a conviction as brothers that we're not harsh with our wives. You know, my, my wife used to talk a lot like the brothers talk. She used to shove me around and stuff, and she rebukes like a brother rebukes. And so since she acted like a brother, I just treated her like a brother. It was awful. Ted's back there going, Bro. I've learned, I've learned. Are you listening, Jonathan? All right, that's our, that's our newly married guy over here, you know? Your wife's not even here to see it. Where'd she go, you know? Okay, she's over there, okay. Yeah, he's not going to be harsh with you anymore, okay? Amen. But you know, uh, then children, where'd all the kids go? All the kids walked out of the room. They knew it was coming. They knew it was coming. He says, children, obey your parents in everything. Notice how he doesn't say it. For it, what's fitting in the Lord. It just says everything with the kids. Amen. Yeah. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Then the dads get it again. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. You know, when you see kids walking around discouraged, you know what's happening in their home. End of story. You don't even have to ask any questions. You see kids who come around week after week after week, and they just kind of look down. You better have a talk with that dad. See, right here it says something that's very clear in verse 16. With believers, we are supposed to teach and admonish one another. You know, that means you have to know what's going on with people. It's not just, okay, let me pick an arbitrary topic and just go teach somebody. Now, you're, not, you're supposed to know what's going on in each other's lives so that you can help one another with it. Right. Yeah. That means you have to open up what's going on in your life for that to happen, amen? amen. Yeah. See, if you don't love the Lord your God with all your mind and all your soul and all your heart, you will not open your life to your brothers and sisters. Right. Because you don't trust them because you're not a disciple. Wow. Come on. Well, good news is you can be one. Come on. <laughs> But see, some of you try and judge and qualify who can teach you and who cannot. Some of you think some of the people in the church are too young to teach you. Some of you who are young think you're too good to be taught. Talk about that. That wasn't written in my lesson either until that comment came. But see, that takes us back to verse 11. There is no Greek or Jew uncircumcised or circumcised, slave or free. You know, you can have people of other races disciple you too. You can have a younger person teach and admonish you. You better let the older people teach and admonish you if you're younger. But we try and dictate. Oh, well, I don't think they're doing too well spiritually. I don't want to hear what they have to say. But what if they open up God's Word and read it? You're not going to listen because of them? Do people's sins disqualify what God's Word says? Are their sins more powerful than our God and His Word? 
that you can't listen if they open up the Bible? You see, some of you won't listen to certain people because you're not listening for God's Word. You're focusing on the person. Mm, come on. Your, your mind is set on things below. Your heart is set on earthly things, and who's going to tell you? Yeah. Oh, what, if the church leader tells you now it's more powerful? <laughs> you know, what if one of our 10-year-olds wants to show you something from the Scriptures? Wow. Well, you're not even a disciple yet, kid. Zip it. Wow. Or are you listening for the Word of God? Come on. That anyone who speaks the Word of God can help you with your life. Anyone who speaks God's Word can teach you and admonish you and help you to grow so that you can become the best person that you could possibly be. See, this world says only learn from certain people. The Bible says be taught and admonished by everyone. Now, that doesn't mean just because somebody brings something to you that they're right. But you should want to listen. Come on. You should be able to hear what's right and hear what's wrong and chuck out what's wrong and be grateful that someone cared enough to teach you something. Because let me tell you, in the world, and nobody cared nothing about what goes on in your life. They could care less whether you're going to heaven or not. Whether you're having a good day or not or a bad day or not. Only in the kingdom of God do people have the love of Christ in their hearts. You know, uh, why do we talk about coming to church and not mouthing the words to the songs? Well, he talks about singing songs and hymns to one another. You know, when we sing at church, do you know you're supposed to actually look at other people when you sing sometimes? You're supposed to sing to the song leaders. The song leaders are up here. Aren't they doing a fantastic job every week? I mean, guys. But it's like pulling teeth with some of you to get you to sing with all of your heart. I have a challenge for you. Okay? I have a challenge for you. Lose your voice once. If you haven't lost your voice once, you haven't sung with all your heart yet. I mean, I mean, that's just the truth. It feels good to give all your heart to God. I mean, I went. My wife and I went to see Tony Braxton in concert last night, and they were so fired up. Ten minutes before the ten minutes before the show. The place was empty. And in like five minutes, 5,000 people filled that place up. I was like, whoa. That's crazy. But let me tell you, when it started, they were fired up. Like, dang! This is a woman singing about sin. And everybody's all fired up about it. Hey, yeah! You know, she's singing all the women like... Come on, <laughs> My wife even did that a couple times. I was like, I was like, and yeah, it's funny. Even Tony Braxton tried to help everybody out. Do you guys realize I sing about sad love songs? Wow. I sing about people getting their their heart broke. Like they're not encouraging songs. I was like, come on, Tony. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I'll be doggone if I come into God's church and people struggle with being more fired up at church than they are at a concert. You know, that's got to flip around, guys. That's got to flip around. Seriously. We can't follow the pattern of the world ten minutes before service and nobody's here. You know, starting the singing and everybody's mouth, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's garbage. That is not worship of God. And the reason you don't sing to each other is because you're too embarrassed about how you're singing. Because you're not singing to God. Yeah. Set your heart on things above. Come on, bro. Come on. You know, we got to sing to each other, guys. Yeah. We come here to honor God and to worship Him. Some of you can't even sit next to each other. You always want to go sit in the back. Come sit next to your brothers and sisters. Give all your heart to God and make the services what they are supposed to be. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
But the acid test of all acid tests of whether you're, not, whether you're living a righteous and holy life is how you treat your neighbor. Verse 17, whatever you do, in word or deed, do in the name of the Lord. This rule reminds us that God judges every single thing we do. And there's two main areas that he closes out with, focusing on, in regards to loving our neighbor as ourself. The first one is how we live at home, and the second is how we are at work. Yeah. 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 Wow. Come on, bro. I mean, think about it. How do you live in the privacy of your own home? Husbands and wives. We're going to do it again because the kids just showed up. Y'all are in for it now. Just kidding. But I mean, seriously, how are things going in your house? Is there love? Is there peace? Or is there all the stuff that God said to get rid of going on in your house? Kids, are you obeying your parents? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but see, right here at the end, he tells us how we're supposed to look at work in verse 22. Slaves. Obey your earthly masters in everything. And do it not only when their eye is on you and when their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as if working for the Lord and not for men, since you know you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. And he closes out strong. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong. And there is no favoritism. Masters, chapter 4, verse 1, it's our last verse. Provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. This is what we're supposed to look like at work. Do you argue with your boss or do you obey your boss? Do you show up on time? You know, I described who I was before I was a disciple. I was this lazy little kid running off to hide in the back. Do you run off and hide so that you can not work? I see a couple faces going. (laughs) You know, since I've been a disciple, uh, I don't want to lift myself up in any way, but this is a product of the kingdom, okay? I've been promoted at every single job I've, I've worked at. Every single one of them. I've started at the very bottom at every one of them and worked my way up at every single job that I've been at. That is, I'm still that lazy kid. But see, I have a new life where I'm transformed. I have brothers and sisters that counsel me and are in there with me. that have taught me. See, every employer wants to hire a disciple. They just don't know it. (laughs) Because a disciple is honest. A disciple is hardworking. A disciple shows up early to everything and does their part. A disciple is selfless and a servant. A disciple doesn't complain about anything, but just goes above and beyond in the name of the Lord. And so that's who we are as disciples. Or we're not a disciple. Because you can't just be a disciple at church. You've got to be a disciple at home. And you've got to be a disciple at work. And he ends up here with two final reminders about the severity of not obeying these rules for eternity. First he says there's an inheritance for those who obey. Now that's awesome. But then he says, anyone who does not obey these rules will be repaid for their wrong. You know, he's not just talking about hell. He's talking about a ruined life by not obeying these rules. 
And he says, there's no favoritism. Don't think you can get around like God's going to forget. He ain't Grandpa God who forgets everything. Okay? Let me tell you, you don't obey, He's going to get you. He's going to repay you. And then He'll call you to repent. And if you do, it'll be good for you. I want to close this out with, with one verse. It's the very first verse that we show everybody we say the Bible. Let's go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 and verse 1. Now I'm going to need you guys' help with this. Go through it. Okay. Blessed are they whose, whose ways are blameless. And we all know the word blessed means what? Absolutely. Superlatively happy. That's right. And so superlatively happy are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Now help me out here. If your ways are blameless, are you obeying or disobeying? Obeying. Okay, awesome. Who walk according to the law of the Lord. If somebody's walking according to the law of the Lord, are they obeying or disobeying? Obeying. Okay, let's read through the rest of this and see if he's not trying to tell us something. They do nothing wrong. Obeying or disobeying? Obeying. They walk in His ways. You have laid down precepts that will be fully. Obey. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in Obey. your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart. Why? Because I am what? Obey. As I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. Young men. How can a young man keep his way pure? <laughs> by obeying. By living according to your word. I will seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Brothers and sisters, God does not suggest holiness. He does not suggest righteousness. He demands it. Break these rules long enough and you surely will die for your lack of love for God. But live by them. Grow in them. And you will have a peace that transcends all understanding of all mankind because of those rules. Then you and all those you have evangelized will appear with Jesus in glory on that last day. Thank God He gives us rules for an eternity. Love you all. Have a great day. Amen.